the population of this country has lost so much over the last 40 years. We've had a constant stream of neoliberal policies which are removing the welfare state and removing protections the public have relied on. What our, what our grandparents did for us, fought in the World War and came back to a society which guaranteed them basic rights and services. And those have been pulled away one by one. The NHS is the last and the most important pillar of the welfare state. And if we don't fight to save it, we'll lose it and we will regret it for a very long time. The preparation for this pandemic in terms of what the government have been doing has been very bad. Uh, there have been organisational changes within the NHS. Uh, we've seen over the last 10 years the loss of 17,000 beds. There's been defunding of the NHS and we also know we have a staff crisis. So there's a, something like 10,000 doctor vacancies and 40,000 nurse vacancies. So the NHS is struggling to cope with day-to-day -day activity, let alone the extra pressure caused by the pandemic. So that has been government policy and it's part of a broader program of privatisation and undermining the NHS. But other, other problems have come to light recently. The lack of preparedness for pandemic, um, the ignoring of a report published in 2016 where they failed to implement the actions from that report to improve reserves of protective equipment, to store ventilators that might be needed in this exact situation. And the 2012 Health and Care Act actually broke apart the existing public health uh, systems that were in place. So we have a very fragmented and very poorly resourced public health system in this country now. The consequences of years of downgrading of the NHS cuts and closures has meant that the NHS is not in a fit state to mount an effective battle against the pandemic coronavirus pandemic. On top of that, we have leadership within the NHS, which is more interested in managing the public relations and the fallout from their policy, rather than beating effectively with, with the problem. So the public are being now softened up to expect thousands of deaths and also we're seeing in the mainstream media, I saw reports in, in the papers today, where we're seeing scapegoating. So there was an article in, in the Sunday Mail clearly saying that this is all China's fault for being the source of the infection in the first place. And we're also seeing more and more stories of public not following self-isolation and social distancing. So they will be scapegoated too, rather than looking at the root cause of the problem, which has been the government policy and their handling of this crisis. So the NHS has become very politicised. The leadership of the NHS is selected not on their merit or particular abilities, but their willingness to go along with the ideological attack on the NHS. And I've made a film called The Great NHS Heist, and in the film we set out the evidence of the stealth privatisation which has taken place over three or four decades, and part of that is to attack the NHS, to shrink the NHS, and to break it up into a series of assets. The, the hospitals the, and the land, the patient data, and the final thing is the budgets. So with that in mind, the leadership has to be not challenging government policy, but just implementing policy, irrespective of the impact on patient care or the staff. And I'm afraid it doesn't surprise me the government's current approach to the pandemic. It, it fits exactly with the direction of travel that they've been following ever since. Um, so it is difficult to say whether we have a true picture of what's happening with the pandemic. We know that testing has been very lacking compared to other countries, let's say uh, South Korea or Germany, where they've been testing very widely. The policy in this country has not been to test, and it's very difficult 
even for staff to get tested who have symptoms. Uh, at the moment, as far as I'm aware, they're testing patients who are suspected of coronavirus who are seriously sick. But that tells us nothing about those in the community or those with milder symptoms. So we do not have a good picture of the spread of the infection. And that's dangerous because we're potentially sending people home from hospital who have minor symptoms who then go on to infect their whole family and they potentially spread it on to others. So the government's approach is in fact completely going against recommended well-established pandemic and infectious disease uh, policies and, and actions that should be taken. The whole concept of herd immunity as it's been applied to justify government policy is completely misplaced. We talk about herd immunity when you have immunization programs and the necessity to make sure that enough of the population are immunized. So levels of less than 75%, for example, won't provide enough protection. So we, we say the herd immunity needs to be over a third, certain level. What you don't do is subject the population to great risk from a new virus, which we know is far more contagious, far more infectious than uh, seasonal flu, and we know is has a rapid complication of causing people to go into what's called adult respiratory distress syndrome, which causes them to end up on intensive care units. So we, we've heard about the lack of ventilators, and that's certainly an issue. And we also heard that, that the government's procurement processes aren't that clear. Um, some companies from within the, this country have made offers of providing ventilators or procuring ventilators, but the government hasn't chosen to take on, on those offers. And we also hear that they didn't take part in a EU-wide procurement program which was offered to them. From my experience of government policy and their decision making, often the case is they will go for favoured corporations, favoured companies to give out contracts rather than what would make the most practical and logical sense. So it's something that certainly needs to be looked at in closer. Well, if you look at how politics works in this country, um, the Conservative Party is in receipt of donations from major corporations, then often you find that these same major corporations do quite well out of government policy. So we have an almost a capture of the political process with big companies donating money to the government and then getting their way in terms of policies and contracts. So it's very early days to work out how this will, this pandemic will, uh, will cause problems in going into the future. We see the first wave of infections. We need to do as much as we can to suppress the impact of those infections and, and reduce the spread of infection. But we don't know whether those people who have been infected and develop an immune response, whether that response will protect them long term and whether that will provide us enough uh, protection to prevent a further outbreak. And we, we don't know whether the virus mutates. So those people who are supposedly immune now may get affected by a slightly different strain of the same virus. So these are the unanswered questions and only time will tell them. Of them. The fact that uh, the speculation, the hypothesis is that the coronavirus transferred from animals to humans uh, points to the fact that there is a, an issue of the close living of humans with animals. Uh, you know, that points to the spread of humans into animal habitats. Also, certain problems with how we handle animals who are going to be sources of food. So, hygiene measures, uh, dealing with animals in a live situation where humans are coming into contact with them. So extra precaution in markets that are selling animal products, but also we need to respect animal habitat and other environmental concerns that may be setting up problems for the future. 
I think this crisis could have one of two effects. The government may use it as a, another reason to attack the NHS. It may try to spin poor outcomes that we hope won't happen, but may well happen. And they will spin that to attack the NHS. But what I'm hoping the public will see is that we have an NHS that has been deliberately sabotaged and weakened. And it's for those reasons that the NHS couldn't cope well. And we must wake up to the fact that unless the public see what's going on and can see through the lies and the spin and mount a resistance and a fight back to defend the NHS, to call for its renationalization, and to call for the proper treatment of its staff from the doctors all the way down to the cleaners and the caterers, who need to be treated as valued public servants and not simply have a round of applause when we realize how they important are they are but treat them like they're the rest of the time so i've, I've made a film a documentary called the great nhs highs and we set out the threats to the nhs and how the nhs has got to where it is at the moment and also paint a picture of where the NHS is going to be taken unless there's a public pushback. And the main threat is a switch over to an American-style insurance-based system. The biggest threat at the moment and the biggest change that's occurring, and most people are unaware of it, is the changes within general practice. So GP surgeries are closing, they're being maneuvered into merging, and they've also been hoodwinked into signing a new contract which is called a, a primary care network contract. And what that will do over time is to remove the power of the, the GP, remove the patient right to access the GP, which has been there since 1948. And in due course, those budgets that are currently running through GP practices will be taken over by the American insurer United Health and their subsidiary Optum, which is strategically placed throughout the NHS already as we speak and we have the former head of United Health who's currently the CEO of NHS England, Simon Stevens, who's supervising this transition. So the public really need to be confronted with this very painful truth because they're not going to see it from the BBC and, and mainstream media and, and that's why I spent the time and effort in putting the film together, I'm really desperate to get the message out that we develop a critical mass of public who will push against this, what I think is the greatest betrayal of the public interest. So our film, you can see the film, it's uh, on vimeo.com forward slash on demand forward slash the great NHS.